This is Isaac from I&I, and I and i have another video that I'd like to um, go over. Um, but before I start, um, I want to show um, this book that I got last year at a, a Goodwill. And it actually has um, On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. So while back I actually decided to read it so when I was looking through a flat earth video and um, there was um, mention of of this book I thought I would um, check it out and see if I could um, shed a little perspective their official logo and flag in 1543 just days before his death Freemason and Jesuit Nicholas Copernicus published his book on the revolutions of the celestial Freemason spheres, Jesuit. which revived the old heliocentric cosmology of Pythagoras and began the so-called Copernican revolution away from a flat geocentric model and towards a global heliocentric model. Since his book claimed Earth to be a tilting, wobbling, spinning sphere revolving at breakneck speeds around a stationary sun, it was initially met with due incredulity. Copernicus always countered this by claiming his theories were merely hypotheses and shouldn't be considered truth. In his book, he even wrote, quote, The Pythagorean teaching was founded upon hypothesis, and it is not necessary that the hypothesis should be true or even probable. The hypothesis of the movement of the earth is only one which is useful to explain phenomena, but it should not be considered as an absolute truth. Okay, so let's take that right there and take a look at it. Let's go through this. So this is uh, Nicholas Copernicus de Revolution the Bus on Revolution of the Heavenly Spheres, 1543 CE. Let no one untrained in geometry enter here, <laughs> 1543. Now here's some conf part of the confusion, and I'm going to go ahead and read this first uh, paragraph or so. There have already been widespread reports about a novel hypothesis of the work, which declares that the Earth moves whereas the Sun is at rest in the center of the universe. Hence, certain scholars, I have no doubt, are deeply offended and believe that the liberal arts, which were established long ago on a sound basis, should not be thrown into confusion. But if these men are willing to examine the matter closely, they will find that the author of this work has done nothing blameworthy. For it is the duty of an astronomer, astronomer to compose the theory of the celestial motions through careful and expert study. Then he must conceive and devise the causes of these motions or hypothesis about them. Since he cannot in any way attain the true causes, he will adopt whatever, whatever suppositions enable the motions to be computed correctly from the principle of geometry for the future as well as the past. The present author has performed both of these duties excellently. For these hypotheses need not be true, nor even possible. On the contrary, if, if they provide a calculus consistent with observations, that alone is enough. Now, this last sentence or two is where um, I'm sure he got the quote, his quote from. But you have to understand also that that wasn't written by him. This is written by one of his friends who wrote a foreword. For a very long time, it had been assumed that it was him. But even back, this foreword, at first described by Copernicus, is held to have been written by Andrew Osiander, a Lutheran theolo theologian and friend of Copernicus. And then he had made um, a, a letter to Pope Paul III. Even back then, Copernicus was being trolled by flat earthers. So, let me read this. Perhaps there will be babblers who claim to be judges of astronomy, although completely ignorant of the subject, and badly distorting some passage of scripture to their purpose, will dare to find fault with my undertaking and censure it. I disregard them even to the extent of despising their criticism as unfounded, for it is, n it is not unknown that, I would say, Lactantius, otherwise an illustrious writer, but hardly an astronomer, speaks quite childishly about the Earth's shape when he mocks those who declare that the Earth has the form of a globe. Hence, scholars need not be surprised if any such person will likewise ridicule me. Astronomy is written for astronomers. So, the biblical flat earthers and trolls, even in 1545, was a problem. 
But now let's get back. Let's get into the real part of the um, the the first book. Thus, Italy does not see Canopus, which is visible in Egypt, and Italy does not see River's Last Star, which is unfamiliar to our area in the colder region. Such stars conversely move higher in the heavens for a traveler heading southward, like the while those which are high in our sky sink down. Okay, that's obvious. Um, on the other hand, if a light is attached to the top of the mast as a ship draws away from land, those who remain ashore see the light drop down gradually until it finally disappears as though setting. Okay, so there's the curvature over water, ships going over. The earth. the earth together with its surrounding waters must in fact have such a shape as its shadow reveals, for it eclipses the moon with the arc of a perfect circle. Therefore, the earth is not flat as Empedocles and Axanamon thought, nor drum-shaped as Leucippus, nor bull-shaped as Heraclitus, nor hollow in another way as Democritus, nor again cylindrical as Essex Amander, nor does it lower side extend infinitely downward, the thickness diminishing towards the bottom as Xenophanes thought, but is perfectly round as the flops first hold. Okay, so he's telling everybody that it can't be these other shapes. This can be ascertained from the fact that the boundary circles, for that is the translation of the Greek term horizons, see my er uh, earlier video, bisects the entire sphere of the heavens. Okay, so we're going to need this uh, in a second. Okay, so we're going to need this uh, in a second. For it does not follow that the Earth must be at rest in the middle of the universe. Indeed, a rotation in 24 hours of the enormously vast universe should astonish us even more than a rotation of its least part, which is the Earth. Meaning, flat Earthers, flat Earthers are so amazed that the Earth at the equator is spinning a thousand miles per hour. If we're not spinning, everything else is. So just think millions and billions of light years away in exactly perfect order everything is moving around us in perfect unison faster than the speed of light which I'm going to show later the ancients insist that the earth remains at rest in the middle of the universe and that this is its status beyond any doubt yet if anyone believes that the earth rotates surely he will hold that its motion is natural not violent but why does he not feel this apprehension even more for the universe, whose motion must be swifter, the bigger the heavens are than the earth? Or have the heavens become immense because the indescribable violence of their motion drives them away from the center? Would they fall apart if they came to a halt? Were this reasoning sound? Surely the size of the heavens would likewise grow to infinity. For the higher they are driven by the power of their motion, the faster that motion will be, since the circumference of which it must make the circuit in a 24-hour period or in a period of 24 hours, is constantly expanding. And, in turn, as the velocity of the motion mounts, the vastness of the heavens is enlarged. In this way, the speed will increase the size, the size, the speed, to infinity. Okay. And this is all part of the first book. But, so anyways, let's just go, let's think about this now. So... What he's saying is, is it really that astonishing to, to people that we're moving a thousand miles per hour at the equator and we can't feel it and should we be flying off or whatever, you know, the, the claim is? Or is it more astonishing that the whole billions upon billions and trillions of galaxies and stars are all rotating around us uniformly. Just for the Earth to go all the way around the Sun in 24 hours, how long would that take, right? You can calculate this because we're just talking about a circle and the circumference. And then just keep going out and further and further and further. At what point would you have to be going faster than the speed of light? Let's take a look. Now these are just some rough calculations that I made. Let's consider the Earth is in the middle, right? But I'm, I have the sun list here, and everything else is moving around, right? So this is basically the radius from the center, okay? So we get to the Earth, okay? Well, the radius from the sun, um, 152 
million kilometers, right? So if you calculate that out with the circumference calculation, that's um, 955 million kilometers. Divide that by 24 hours and that's about 39 million 793,507 miles per hour or 3.68 percent of the speed of light. Okay, Which the speed of light is almost a miles per hour. Right? So that's the Earth, right? So as you see, as we get further out, when we get to Jupiter, the circumference increases and the faster you have to be going. So now we're at 18.88 percent the speed of light. Uranus, larger again, 69.81 percent the speed of light. So the actual cutoff would be Neptune at 4.5 kilometers. The circumference would be 28, meaning you would have to go 1.2 miles per hour, which would be 109% of the speed of light. So essentially faster than the speed of light, okay, to figure out how far you could go out to get the speed of light, um, the radius would have to be to make a circuit of 24 hours, like Gal or like Copernicus had a question. So a 4.125 4 trillion kilometer radius gives you almost a 26 uh, or kilometer circumference, which is a and 79,922,475 kilometers per hour, which would be 99.99% of the speed of light. So, what if you were a light year away? 229,341 per times or percent the speed of light to make a 24 hour circuit. Alpha Proxima is a radius of. 40, wait, trillion, quadrillion <laughs> kilometers? I can't see my eyes. Million, oh no, billion, trillion. Oh, you know what? I was saying these wrong up here. This is 40 trillion. Um, these are billion up here. 40 trillion. But anyways, the point is we're at 979,286 times percent the speed of light. And then take it all the way out to the observable universe. So we have millions, billions, trillion. Man, huge, right? Because it's 13.9 billion light years, so, right? That times. 13 point billion and you get this insane number and then you can see how this just gets completely ridiculous ah, just how fast the very furthest stars would be rotating around us to complete that 24 hour circuit so I don't know you tell me leave comment um, Please tell me what tell me what you think is a flat earther. I love to know. Um, I'm sure it has something to do with ferment or or something. But come on now, just use common sense. I mean, I'm not even I'm not a math major. I'm not a science major. I'm nothing. Just just calculate that out yourself and, and imagine. Is it really that hard to believe? The Earth is, is spinning 1,000 miles per hour at the circumference with the solar system and everything else moving? Or is it more uh, believable to think that every single star and planet has perfectly lined up their exact uh, rate up to, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of millions percent the speed of light to make that 24-hour circuit. Very simple. Leave a message. Uh, leave a comment. Send this to a flat earther and um, like this if you if it is okay. Um, I'd rather have more likes than dislikes. Anyways, that's all. Thank you. Appreciate your time.